Everyone's still masking up outside, and I've, I, I've had this happen with every girl during COVID where I refuse to wear my mask, and then, like, after about 20 minutes, they just start not wearing theirs, too, once I've given the, the lead that I don't give a fuck. I don't have to bully them or say anything. Yeah. They just naturally just follow the lead of what I'm doing. <laughs> we're, we're talking of, uh, I'm talking about Kevin Samuels. Kevin Samuels. You know Kevin Samuels? No, I don't know him. Dude, what are you? Well, you maybe you're. Uh, uh, he he mostly he was bigger in like the black community. Uh, oh yeah. You know uh, you're familiar with Patrice O'Neill and Dante Nero. Oh yeah. Have you ever listened to the Black Phillip show? No, I haven't. Dude, but he's, I know. What are you doing, I know, man? I know. Go home right fucking now <laughs> and listen to all 16 episodes of the Black Phillip show. The Black Phillip show. It will. It's on YouTube. Oh yeah. It'll change the way. You, f- you not only deal with women, but feel about yourself. In a good way? In, a, in, the, in the best way. All right. In, in a way, in a, in a, it'll revolutionize your manhood. Really? I mean that. Well, I'm going to have to listen to it now. I promise, this, this for me and for many other guys I know, and for comics especially too, uh, it's, it's, like, it's like the Rosetta Stone of, of going from boyhood to manhood. Um, when I listened to what he said on that show, not only that is it the funniest thing you'll ever hear in your life, but it, I listened to it after I got out of a toxic seven year relationship and mm-hmm. I go, Oh, if I had done this shit, I could have maintained the relationship, which looking back on it, I didn't want to anyway, but I also could have ended it so much sooner. Yeah. So it was so much pain and suffering and disrespect. I allowed, I allowed to happen. Yeah, yeah, that was one thing when I when I found myself in a toxic relationship. It was, and and looking back on it, I'm like, I'm a new person now. I I, I could have cut it off. Like I have no tolerance for the shit she put me through. Mm. And I would have had I been more experienced with life, I would have been like, I'm not doing this. I'm not playing your stupid games. I'm done. You know what I mean? Because it's like, it's like, uh, I mean, part of it was because I lived through it and I could see all the red flags. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of it maturing was that, like, I could, because you, when you, when you're not at that point yet, you feel you cling on to stuff, you know what I mean? Unnecessarily, because you can't stand on your own. Well, it's also, uh, what I think it comes from is when you're younger and you're dating, Mm -hmm. you think that you, you get a girl and you go, I I struck oil. You, 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 it's like, you think... I'm trying to think of something to compare it to. It's like it's like you're a Native American and you get a musket from some Europeans and you go, "Ah, oh, look at this!" And then you find out everyone has a fucking musket, mm-hmm. right? There's not. You get this girl and you think this is the the one forever, and the reality is there's billions of them. Yeah, there's billions, and there's no. You know, you 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 can walk away tomorrow, and that's your greatest that's your greatest asset as a man. Is the fact that I can leave and walk away? Yeah, yeah, and, and then, it's also where sometimes they're they're in the same boat. They're not they're not mature enough to realize you could leave. Yeah, you know well, what I mean. So they, they cling on to you. I don't think that's the thing that most of them mature out of. All right, <laughs> I'm gonna be real with you. I think I think is a because I say when I look at most people that are in fucked up marriages, it's because the wife and this this is like one of the cornerstone joke of my act is that they believe my husband will not leave me. Yeah. And that's part of what they, their domestication process is. Mm-hmm. You go from a guy... They get you when you're a dude who's in your prime, right? Mm-hmm. And you can go out and you can get laid and you can potty and you can fuck bitches and then they slowly kind of take that away from you. Mm-hmm. If you let them, right? Yeah. Right? They stop baking you cookies and they do that kind of stuff. And you start getting pudgy and you lose your game. And then years go by, and they're like, "All right, well, you're not gonna leave me now. You're fat, and you fucking have no confidence. What are you gonna? You're not gonna leave, Jerry. This That's is right, it. Yeah. This is this is the. And if you let that simmer too long, you know, you you end up with the Amber Heard situation. She's taking a dump in your bed. You yeah. Know? So was the dump a vengeance dump? I think so. I think that yeah. was the. It was done spitefully. I mean, it wasn't wasn't for humor. Like you and I know comics, people might do that for a joke. But yeah. she did it. I mean, I would spite. I would use shit not only as a joke but out of vengeance too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the that's that's been like a fun little interesting story. Because mm-hmm. yeah, crazy because it's I'm rooting as a guy. 
and as a fan of him, I got a root for Johnny. Yeah. All right. But I also know there's no way where a guy can be doing that much coke and drinking that much and hanging out with those people and not be fucking nuts too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have heard a lot of people speak very highly of him too, and a lot of people who come out about Amber is like she's just a horrible person. So he probably, I would say, he probably snapped a few times too. I would have. If you mm-hmm. if you push me enough, you know, I and especially if you're uh, self medicating, we'll say, like like Johnny, <laughs> like Johnny does, you know, he he probably fucking snapped a few times, you know. And, and then that coke rage, I can't imagine coke rage. doing coke that long into my life. Yeah, Be what is he? Fifty like something? He's in his fifties. Yeah, ripping lines in your mid fifties. Oh man, that's like, just begging for a heart attack. Yeah, but also he's that's what happens when you date, like. He's dating young bitches. So you get young girl problems. Yep. You know, yep. he's not dating. And I get it. That's the benefit of being famous. Mm-hmm. The beauty of being famous is I get to date women that are hot and in their 20s till I'm dead. Mm-hmm. That That's what you get. But also it comes with a serious problem in that I'm 35. I wanted to date with a 26-year-old. And I went, yeah, fuck this. Yeah. I was just, ow. Like, you know what it was is she was still... I could tell that she still wanted to impress me, but more importantly, impress herself in an attempt to figure out who she was. And I go, I don't have time for this. Yeah, yeah. I don't have time for you to brag to. She was, because she was kind of bragging to me about her career and the money she made. And I was like, that doesn't mean shit to me. I'm a man. I don't fucking care if you work to drive through a McDonald's. Yeah. Or if you're the CEO of, of, uh, of a Fortune 500 company. Well, you know, I'll be honest. I could... I could use that. That would be money. nice. A sugar mom would be but cool. But yeah. at the end of the day, it's not what we look for in a woman. Right, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I don't care what, what my girlfriend makes, you know? See, this is this is why you should have listened to Kevin Samuels. He went on, he went on. <laughs> Ke- so Kevin Kevin was a dude who women would call into his show on mm-hmm. his Instagram lives or whatever, and he would say, and a girl would go, I want a man who makes this much money. He's going to have six figures. He's going to have uh, six-pack abs. And he's going to do this. And he's going to do that. And he's going to and he's gonna be good looking and charming and blah, blah, blah. And then Kevin would go, describe yourself to me. And she'd go, what? And he'd go, so uh, how tall are you? I'm 5'3". I'm All right. So how, how do you have kids? I get two kids. Ugh. How much money do you make? I make like 50 grand a year on a good year. I was like, all right. So uh, how much do you weigh? And she'd be like, mm. Like two fifty, five three and two fifty. <laughs> like shit, are you are you on the offensive line for the Cincinnati Bengals? And then and that that was the the best part was sometimes it would be unnecessarily cruel, but it was funny. He mm-hmm. would say mean shit to him, but it was also shit you had to hear. Yeah. And he did it to guys too, because guys would call up and be like, "I can't find a good woman," and he'd say, "What do you do for work?" And he'd go, well, "I'm an Uber Eats delivery driver," and he's like. Come on, come on! Like, yeah. what are you? You're going. He he told people, be realistic about what you can get in your range, mm-hmm. all right? And he, because every, it's like people walking into a car dealership, and with they only get this much money and this much credit, and they go, "I want a Ferrari," and mm-hmm. you're gonna go, "Dude, you no, it's yeah. not how this works." Yeah, I, I actually I had a joke about that because of Tinder and the internet dating and stuff where I, w- I went on there and they tell you not to show much discernment, you know, lower your standards a little bit, swipe right on whoever you can. And I swipe right and right and right. And, and but I watched this girl at when I was at a club one time and I was sitting behind her and she swiped left on every single dude, just didn't, didn't read his profile or anything, just left. And, and it's like, you're holding out for a Ferrari, but you know, you could get a Sentra that'll last you you know, 600,000 miles mm-hmm. and that central will eat your ass for that whole time. You know what I mean? It's just, it's it, this weird thing with the internet because nobody's told they're wrong anymore. Yeah. I think. And it, nobody, nobody gets that humbling experience like you were talking about where you need to be beaten down a little, no matter who you are. You do. You know? I, I was a fat fuck throughout my, my childhood and into high school. Mm-hmm. And the reason I lost weight is because my dad humiliated me. Like, we would go to the beach, and he'd be like, hey, why is Mike wearing a shirt? <laughs> Mike, you're going in the water. You can take your shirt off. 
<laughs> what are you hiding under your shirt? And like, just like people would come over the house and he'd be like, oh, I think I'm going to have to. St-. Like, we watched an episode of King of the Hill where Bobby has to shop at a fat kid store called Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> Remember my aunts and my uncles and my, my cousin came over with some of her friends. And like, he, the kids, they were like, Oh, here's, uh, here's Jeff. Jeff used to be, fat. we call him Fat Jeff. He's like, he's skinny. Oh, he played hockey. And uh, he goes, can you get my kids into that? Because I got to shop at the Humpty Dumpty store for their fat asses <laughs> and just do shit. And eventually, it got me to lose weight. Mm-hmm. Oh, at the same time, it was on him because he fed me and I was a kid. And he only fed me like fast food and canned goods and poison. <laughs> but it, if it wasn't for that, if he had just been like, you're okay how you are, I would never have done anything yeah. about it. Yeah, I'm at that point now. I'm just you're getting, not that bad, dude. Well, I'm not that bad, but it, yeah, I should be like 190. I'm like 230. Yeah, you should get down to two. Yeah, at least get down. What are you? What are you doing? What are you? <sighs> now, I mean, I tried. I tried going to the gym, but lifting weights is just boring. What? It's Cardio's just boring. boring. Lifting weights it's all, is. A- it's just like, uh, <laughs> boy, if I'm doing like, uh, like. If I got jujitsu or something, I'm doing something. You know what I mean, yeah. and then getting lean from that. All right. You know what I mean. I, I, I'll do it if it's boring. It does do make have, me feel better. But do you have a weightlifting partner? No, I don't. See, that's it. Makes yeah. it so much harder when you don't have a partner. Yeah. When the beauty of lifting weights is that you still get to eat food like a fat fuck. That's well, true. Well, to a degree. To a you degree. You just cut. You eat more protein and less carbohydrates, but yeah. You still get to go in on it. I mean, well, it's a be- this is why you got to listen to. Uh, Black Phillips show, Patrice explains how you don't, it doesn't matter what ailment you have as a man. Mm-hmm. If you have charisma and charm, you can get bitches. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. I got, I, I've been broke pretty much my entire life. It never got in the way mm. of me getting ass or yeah. having relationships ever. No, and, and with women who had better jobs than me and like I was just telling Jeff, I'm getting, I got, I was getting messaged by this girl. Uh, hold on, this is I gotta bring this up on the show. I normally wouldn't yeah, just check my phone. <laughs> <laughs> so so I've been putting like memes of Kevin Samuels, right? Mm-hmm. And this now for the record, this is a single woman in her 30s, uh, career girl, New York City, and I like I used to fuck her, right? Mm-hmm. We used to fuck, and. She goes, who the fuck is this clown when I put up a Kevin Samuels picture? And I go, don't act like you don't know the great Kevin Samuels. And she says, I really don't. And I'm like, you wouldn't call him a clown yeah. if you didn't have a reference point. She goes, has he? I go, oh, he gives relationship advice. I go, has he helped you? And I go, no, because I was already at a better point in my life. Right? And uh, she goes, uh, you know, I know, but I appreciate what he's doing. She goes, like, I go, oh, he just kind of explain through the evolutionary aspects of why men and women want what they like she goes sounds like bullshit and i'm like why are you lying like why yeah. do girls do this where you just lie you could have just said i don't like this dude you clearly know him i i said what's that why is it bullshit you've never heard of this guy then you ask me for information and negate what i said um i looked him up after you said there's not enough room here and found that he was singled and divorced twice Sounds super qualified to give relationship advice. But that is someone who's qualified to give yeah. relationship advice. My parents have never been divorced and they have a horrible relationship. Yeah. Yeah, you so, wanna get you wanna get like advice for drugs from someone who's been addicted. Yeah. They've had they've they fucked up. You wanna hear it from them, you know? And like I told Jeff, I was like, I'm holding it like it, the beauty of this situation is that at some point I can just go, you know I fucked you multiple times, right? <laughs> <laughs> like that's kind of like the 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 nuke, as Jeff was saying in your pocket of, of what do you do? like? I you're a you're this career woman who doesn't want family and all that, and that's fine. I whatever. Yeah. I, but don't come around and act like my ass didn't didn't get. I fucking I got under all your walls, okay? All right, the fucking <laughs> great walls of Constantinople. I got through them. I got I found the back door. And I was in there mucking around, so don't don't give me that shit. <laughs> it's it's a weird. There's this need for for a lot of women to just be obtuse for no reason. Yeah, you could have just had this discussion with me, and uh, like I look at a divorce as like a, a, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. Yeah, you're not the I people, and it it shows like kind of she 
is a modern woman but still has this outdated concept of the perfect marriage is I get married and then I'm with the same person forever. Mm -hmm. As if you don't get bored with people. Motherfuckers don't change. Well, you could have picked wrong. Yeah, yeah. How long How long has your longest relationship been? Uh, about three years. Yeah? Yeah. Is that the toxic one? No, no, that was that was the boring one. Yeah, because uh, I had a I had a to- I had two toxic ones right back to back, and I was with one of them for two years, one of them for like a couple months, because I was like I'm out, and then I was single for three years, which is important too, because uh, I've seen people just go from relationship to relationship and they don't change. It's like you realize you're doing something wrong. You just got to be single and figure yourself out for a while, mm-hmm. and not enough people do it. No, they just had they have this desire for acceptance and someone. to coddle them in a way and i but i threw all that out i'm just like i'm just gonna be single yeah and i was single for three years then i was with this girl who she was cool um she's not a bad person but she uh she's just she kind of sucked the life out of me you know what i mean like her (laughs) not not in a good dick sucking kind of way right yeah but but it wasn't a malicious way either it was it was just kind of like was she just depressing yeah kind of kind of i mean i i felt like i couldn't be myself around her Mm. And uh, but we would go to metal shows a lot. You know, I'm a big metalhead, and so it kind of prolonged it. Like, oh, the next concert we're gonna go to. Oh, great, great. It should have only lasted like a year and a half, but it went What's, three. Was it like dating in the metal scene? Uh, I don't. I don't feel like the women I be getting the women I be getting there are quite stable by any means. Uh, no, they're not. They're nah. not. That's why my current girlfriend listens to country and whatever's on the radio. I I don't have a want. To date a girl who's into a rock scene, whether it's punk, hardcore, metal, yeah. whatever, because I've I've known them and I've worked with them, and it's just like, oh baby, <laughs> like once once you start putting that black makeup on mm-hmm. and piercing that many, once you get to face tattoos, I go, this is. I can't fix this. <laughs> right, right. They're a good time, though, for a month or so. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, if you're into sadomasochism, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. No, she wasn't bad. I've been with my current girlfriend for two and a half years. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we get along really well. See, I, I, I. So you said you you mentioned how people need to take time to be alone. I think that's really important. Mm. But what people miss is that some of them they just keep that going. Yeah, they stay. Uh, I looked up with this girl who was like, "Oh, I've been single for for ten years," and I go, "Oh shit!" Wow. And trust me, her personality uh, reflected it. Uh, and what I mean mm-hmm. by that is, how old are you? 35. Oh, you're the same age as me. Yeah. So, see, you are you don't have to worry about this because you're not single. But something happened as I left New York City, as I went to like rural New England, mm-hmm. and also as I've gotten older that the age range has gone up. I'm not quite pulling women in their 20s unless I would go out to the right place. I also don't have the patience for it. If I, yeah. I'm sure I could do better if I was willing to to find the, the weak links. And <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, I've noticed that uh, you start to find women who have been perpetually single. And there's this, they, they put off this, well, you, you know, men don't like a woman with opinions. And I go, oh, they don't? No, is it? And then what they mean by opinions is I'm fucking, I'm I'm an abrasive cunt <laughs> and I'm unwilling to find compromise or self-reflection. Yeah. And as a result of that, uh, I can be insufferable to be around mm-hmm. and I have, you know, I can have ridiculous opinions because I have ridiculous opinions and but i'm i'm unwilling to reflect on them yeah like it comes back to the internet thing they just want people to agree with them mm. all the time it's like i mean if you look back at your own parents they probably didn't agree on everything no or almost nothing sometimes you know what i mean you don't have to agree with anybody nobody has to agree with you you just have to understand that people are different and right now i think the world's really run by opinion too like everything is opinion you know what i mean does that you, do you see that too? Yeah, yeah. Well, we, everyone just states their opinion and expects people to agree so, with them. So this is kind of my philosophy on the world: is that there's there's a balance of energies. All right, there's a yin and yang, as mm-hmm. um, exists in Eastern and Taoist philosophy, and 
the the yang is masculine and the yin is feminine and there needs to be a balance mm-hmm. and this is something i've this is something i i noticed when i was like went to a museum on indigenous stuff in colombia and throughout in his exists in hinduism there's a belief of a balance of energies light and dark masculine and feminine mm-hmm. and i think at least western civilization has gone way too feminine really yes and that's why people are ruled overly by emotions because mm-hmm. the masculine view of the world is cold hard logic you ever deal with a woman and she's do- she's just illogical and it makes you fucking angry yeah right and you yeah. get angry and you're just angry at the pure lack of logic now that's the masculine side. We view the world through logic, but mm-hmm. also we can be heartless. We don't take in certain considerations that a woman would, mm-hmm. um, where t- we can be overly rigid. We're unwilling to, we're more willing to cause confrontation that leads to greater confrontation mm-hmm. when we don't have to. Women, on the other hand, view the world through emotion. That's a feminine view of the world. It's a highly emotional view, mm-hmm. which has its place but can also be like deer or rabbits feeding in the forest when there's no predators. They just overeat and mm-hmm. refuse to acknowledge the problem. Here's, here's like kind of a, I'll give you one in instance that's relevant right now. And I, I had a joke about this years ago and I'm trying to bring it back and it never worked before. And I don't think it's going to work now, but <laughs> women say that abortion's a woman's issue. Mm-hmm. All right. And I go, what about trans men? Is it a woman's issue? Or is it sometimes a man's issue? Because you told me that if men can get pregnant, Mm -hmm. then it's no longer a woman's issue. And they'll, well, then it's a uterus issue. And I go, well, then what about trans women? Are they not women? Should they not be included in on this? All right? You've kind of- It's like you spiraled down this rabbit hole. You've lost, so you have, their argument has entered a a logical fallacy. This Mm -hmm. is the part of the movie- at the end where the AI or the robot, you trick it and it self implodes. Yeah. But because it's a feminine viewpoint, their emotion overtakes any form of like there's no logical like mm-hmm. mechanism to shut the computer down. They just go, I don't care. Yeah. I don't care that I was illogical here. It doesn't matter. I yeah. feel this. And so I think that's where a lot of uh my opinion, uh, why things are so overly mm. opinionated. Because someone can can call me and be like, Oh, fuck you and your opinion. Mm-hmm. All right, whatever. I, I would say it's either that or it's like an, just a total imbalance because I could see in some ways that the masculine energy is is almost like you have the the super liberal people screaming in the face of police and stuff like that. That's like a, that's a masculine thing. But it, I think in that propensity, I think it's a, it's a, I think yeah, it's a yeah, yeah. feminine. The emotion reproduction is, of masculine, yeah, which okay, is why yeah, yeah. what I view feminism as is is I'm recreating what I think manhood is, right? Yeah. It's like fucking splendor to sugar, except like it's it's this is, and it's still an emotion. Anger yeah, yeah. is a raw emotion. Yeah. Screaming and yelling, going, ah, that's you losing control of yourself mm-hmm. and logically giving up logic in the face of emotion. Yeah, uh, yeah. it's just viewed as a more masculine one. Yeah. So, but also, I I don't put it all on them. I put it on men for giving up accountability. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. that's dude. That's where I figured out from like you know Black Phillip showing all that stuff was how to be a better man was just accountability. Mm-hmm. Is it's on me? It's like it was the biggest thing I had to realize is when my girl is fucking up, it's my fault. Mm-hmm. It's it's whatever she does is my fault. All right. Is she Acting out of sorts. Well, why haven't I fixed it? Mm-hmm. Why haven't I guided this? Why haven't I protected myself and this relationship we've built from her emotions? Right. Right? Like I And I, I had to deal with an alcoholic father, so I know what it's like when someone comes home and they're illogical. Mm-hmm. And you, gotta, you don't hit them like a brick wall. You kind of like, you do a nice Bruce Lee thing where... I think it's jujitsu where you allow their own momentum to throw them out of the way. Yeah. And then you go, all right. We want to deal like deal with this like adults. Cut it out. Is what I, is when you when a girl gets gets a t- gets a temper tantrum on you. Yeah, and the other the other part of that is um, where I think I do think therapy is a scam. But I did yeah. go to a therapist for a bit, and they did teach me some things like no matter what your significant other or this other person in your life that's causing you troubles, you can't 
necessarily control what they do. You no. can only control. So you have to look at everything like it's your fault in a way, mm-hmm. uh, but not beat yourself up. Just like I'm in control. Yeah. You know, because you can't control them. You're you can only control yourself. And, you know. Did, did you, so you, you therapy didn't really work for you? Or? Uh, I think because it was right at the tail end of that toxic relationship. And I, I think it gave me some perspectives. But ultimately, all they do is Socratic method you. Well, why do you think that way? Yeah. Why does it make you feel like that? It's like, I could have done this on my own. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? But sometimes you just need someone to do it for you. I, yeah. Because therapy did help me, but my therapist wanted me to meet every week. And I go, I don't have this money, dude. Yeah, yeah. What are you, what are you doing? I don't have this money to meet every fucking week. Not only that, but at the, I kept saying, you know, once I, I, I had a view that eventually I would get to a point, like with a chiropractor, where I would fix certain things and not need to come. And he was under this impression that therapy was a forever thing. Mm-hmm. And if I had great insurance, I would go, but I wouldn't go as much. Like the idea is, my belief is eventually you get better. Mm-hmm. And I don't have to see you that often. Yeah. If I need to come all the fucking time, well, dude, what's the point? Yeah. Yeah. It's like you're not curing anything. No. What is it? What was, uh, what was, you have a guy or a girl for a therapist? It was a guy. Yeah? Yeah. I, I wonder what it, if I could do like a woman therapist hmm. if without wanting to just bang her. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah, I they, think I would go full Tony Soprano and I just like you, fantasize yeah. about smashing her. Yeah. I think I think that would be, you know, this person's helping you. Stick it in her. Yeah. Well, you know, it would be. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it would cause like a real Oedipus Rex complex. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, because she, she's maybe she's taking on like a maternal figure, a nurturing thing. Yeah, um, which like when I, I'm not trying to date single moms because it's just I I don't I don't want to make a kid deal with me. Uh, but also, <laughs> it's a huge turn on because when I see a woman being good mother, I go, oh, now that's a woman. That's yeah, some yeah. womanly I shit. See, yeah. Like watching a girl stumble down the street drunk, I'm like, ah, yeah, it doesn't do it for me. Or well, like when, as we said, when a girl's like, I, I make this much money, and I was like, you gotta have. Mm-hmm. Like when when I, when I get all angry and militant, I need a girl to be like, all right, all right, Mike, just just relax. Yeah. I don't want her to be like, yeah, fucking get him. Like that's not, right. Yeah, <laughs> that's not, yeah. That's why I kid. That's why I don't want to date a woman who's politically active. Even mm. if she agrees with me, even if she's into my same stances, yeah. I like that when I when I meet a girl and she's like, I just don't care, and I go, Oh, baby, this <laughs> is this is fantastic. Yeah, you are a, a neutral force, and I'm in love with it. Yeah, people who are are too political it just kind of rub me the wrong way. Anyway, it's too much energy. It's too dude. much. Dude, isn't it weird? It's I've been, <laughs> it is really weird. It's weird yeah. for me to meet a like I met some girls when I was, you know, uh, like I guess COVID made a lot of people feel more politically active, and you kind of mm-hmm. had to be, especially because I was unvaccinated. I dealt with that. Still, I had to deal with all that shit. Mm-hmm. So when I would meet a girl who was on the same page with me, I remember matching with a chick from Maine who was like, her profile said, "No liberal pussies." Like an unvaxxed, this, that. And I was like, this should make my dick hard because you're saying all the stuff I'm into. Yeah. But it's not doing it for right, me. Right, yeah. Why? Why? And I go, maybe because I view it as like a masculine thing. I I just want you to just be like, huh, you know, go defend the world, Mike, and I'm going to sit here and make potatoes. And I'm like, is that, <laughs> I think, is that what I want? Yeah. I think so. <laughs> I Here's a re- like, so the girl I'm kind of talking to in South America, I tested her politics by going, um, I said, what do you think of Bolsonaro, who's the president of Brazil? And she goes, I don't like him. And I go, I do. And she goes, all right, we just want to talk politics. <laughs> but it never like it never was a thing. She doesn't. Yeah. But also, it's not part of their culture for, for a woman to feel the need to be politically active. Mm-hmm. It's very weird and rare there for a woman to like make her political ideals part of her personality which is the exact opposite here yeah where a woman goes my defining characteristics are my politics why do you think that is anyway because it's a very recent thing too very recent i think a lot of people have i think in the face of degenerate consumerism Mm -hmm. we've just lost 
our tribe and our culture and our sense of self, and people are just grasping at something. Mm-hmm. And I also think, as we said earlier, that so like I actually had a girl message me on an app because in my profile it said I wasn't a feminist. And it mm-hmm. was like, it's on OKQ, but there's just a checklist. And I wrote, not a feminist. She goes, why aren't you a feminist? And I go, I'm not going to explain this to you because <laughs> I don't want to take the time. But I just wrote, because I'm a man. And she goes, men can be feminist. And here's, I'll say what my response to her would have been, which is, in my opinion, fem- like feminism was really created by, uh, it wasn't a woman thing. It was a kernel of womanhood that was taken by elites, male men, who were like, hey, in the 1900s, we had men, women, and children all in the workforce, and it was great because they all had to work for nothing, and you know we got all we got all the capital we could out mm-hmm. of them. And these damn unions came around, and what was the big part of the labor movement? Get our women and women and kids out of the workforce. Men will work. I'm not sending my women and kids to slave away in factories and mines. And then we did, and then you could afford to have a family of six with a wife that stayed at home with a fucking simple bus driving job. Mm -hmm. And then people were like, hey, you know, we're only using, we're not even using 50% of our potential workforce. The women Mm -hmm. aren't slaving away at these menial fucking jobs. Mm -hmm. And if they get money, then they can get into conspicuous consumerism too because women like spending money more than men. So they go, how do we get bitches out of the home (laughs) and away from their kids and things that give them fulfillment? Uh, and not to say that women wouldn't work back then. They just once they would have started a family, they would become moms. Yeah. Well, they and didn't have to. They exactly. Didn't have to work. It wasn't. You know? It wasn't. You. You. And they could have if they really wanted to, but they didn't have to. And so. basically, they they were like, "All right, we're going to make you." Feminism became them mimicking men mm-hmm. in a way in the workforce. In the, it's why you meet a girl and she talks to you about her career. And as a man, we don't care. Mm-hmm. Just don't really. It, it's a thing, but it's not like we don't. It does it's not a focus point the mm-hmm. way it is for them, and so we focused on. So their political thing is as they that it's it's a representation of what they think a guy is, because men men are, when a guy's young we get politically active we get mm-hmm. angry over shit, we uh, you know we we get all this pent up testosterone that's got to get out through lifting weights, fucking girls. Or breaking shit, you mm-hmm. know, throwing a brick through a window. Oh, it right? feels so good. It, it, it's, <laughs> dude, it's um, Clockwork Orange. Oh, right? yeah. yeah. And you, I don't know if you've seen the movie, oh, yeah. read the book. Yeah. Well, four adolescents go around getting into heinous stuff, breaking shit. Eventually, two of them become cops, right? Yeah. Two of the f- crew. And then the, at the, the other one, now in the American version of the book and the movie, it ends with him just... Um, going back to his old ways right Mm -hmm. the reality of that novel the full british version is that he gets a girlfriend Mm -hmm. and he starts to grow up the last chapter is him is him watching other young dudes act goofy and him kind of maturing out of that and i think that's so long story i think that's why you keep seeing that in girls profiles is they're like oh here's my my substance and here's it's, it's kind of like mimicry of a man or trying yeah. to find something and, and the other thing is they say well well it's because i stand up for women's rights i believe in women's rights like nobody doesn't believe you should have rights yeah i mean i i don't call myself i mean a i don't i'm just I'm kidding i'm kidding i'm kidding ladies i'm just fucking around uh but well yeah i mean like uh of course we all believe in their rights but i don't call myself a feminist because i don't have to identify with some club yeah because you're also you're not you know a pussy I mean? um and that's kind of what that is mm. yeah. it's it's you're getting fake points mm. right yeah you're you're saying what they want to hear and this is what i liked about kevin samuel so much is that he said what people didn't want to hear mm-hmm. and sometimes you need to hear that and the result is you're gonna have to fall on a grenade because once you piss off like there's a so Elon Musk said, well, butrin is dangerous and should be taken off the market. It's an antidepressant. Yeah. He said this on Twitter. And people came out the woodwork. And obviously, Twitter is in a rage. But, but also, if you're on Twitter regularly, you're more likely to be on antidepressants because you're more likely to be a mentally unstable person. Mentally healthy people don't sit on Twitter all day. Yeah. All right? And they certainly don't argue on Twitter. So you've already got, you know, it's been selected for that. But also... 
there was a direct correlation between the people being like, I'm on antidepressants and I'm on SSRIs, and the people who had things like uh, their pronouns in their bio, or uh, their, I'm a male feminist in their bio, or that type of stuff, mm-hmm. which is kind of an in- indicative of uh, I'm unhappy. And in my unhappiness, I'm trying to come up with an identity. Yeah, yeah. Not enough identity, like personal identity in the world right now. Exactly. You know, it's a lot of, uh, I believe this. Well, do you really believe, is this really how you think or did you latch on to that? Because it's not an original idea. No. None of these are original ideas that people think. Uh, nobody has their own, their real opinion from their heart. It's just stuff that's been given to them from all these mediums of social media or people around them or whatever. Nobody really has their own view of the well they have their own view you know what i mean but nobody has their own real thoughts no most of it's unoriginal there's, yeah so is this quote i can't forget the guy's name he was like a canadian philosopher and he said uh he said violence whether spiritual or physical is a quest for identity and the less identity the greater the violence so mm-hmm. take for instance um during, this guy was Canadian. Yeah, that yeah. sounds very Canadian. It's very, that sounds like a Canadian philosopher. Well, it's like it's, it's he. I mean, he may it might have been Asian Canadian because it's got some zenness to it. Uh, oh, no, yeah. he was a white dude <laughs> from Canada, and it's if you look at like the riots during 2020, mm-hmm. I think it was like uh, after George Floyd, there were a lot of riots. Mm-hmm. They the worst riots weren't in black cities. It wasn't in Atlanta or Detroit. Or Chicago, though there were some there, but it was more of just kind of, you know, people kind of grab some shit and were like, all right, I've gotten a... The worst rioting was in the whitest parts of America. It was Seattle, Washington. It was Portland, Mm -hmm. Oregon. It was Wisconsin. It was Minnesota. And you think, why is it that the places with the least minorities, the ones rioting the most? It's because they're looking for identity. Mm -hmm. They're desperately trying to find identity. And this is... All right. I I meant to bring this up because... I've been very critical of Maine because I Maine is the whitest state in America. Yeah. And when I'm in Maine, I can feel this brutal quest for identity amongst Mainers and this like this weird feeling of like this insecurity about being the whitest state. Their whiteness bothers them. Yeah. Which I'm like, guys, it's fine. All right. Do you think Mississippi has black people because they were open minded and diverse? No, they had slavery and you guys didn't. Yeah. Like everyone yeah. makes fun of Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont for being they're very white. I know they didn't have fucking slaves, asshole. <laughs> like, they, yeah. And Maine, I, I think if, it, you know, the Missouri compromise, I yeah. think there were a few people in Maine like, ah, yeah. <laughs> but <I've, laughs> when I, the most radically political people I, I've met. Like the the first only like genuine Antifa people I've met have been from Maine. Well, like really? communist people were Mainers and moved down here, mm-hmm. and it's it's always been a recurring theme I notice with people coming from Maine is this like real like I need to to find myself or find something, mm-hmm. and I so I went. There's also this weird class thing. Maybe you could tell me where I meet people. Not everyone in Maine is a lumberjack. There's a lot of rich motherfuckers in Maine, especially Portland. Yeah. Lots for sure. of tons of insane amounts of money. And I have a friend and uh you know, we went to her family's place at Lake Sebago and it's a mm-hmm. nice piece of property. Like her grandfather made money in oil. And so he has like seven houses on the lake. Wow. And we get up there and she had said, Oh, do you want to come to camp? So I think I'm gonna be in a tent. Like you said, let's go camp. Mm-hmm. But it's like a four-bedroom house. But camp is the word that Mainers use where I'm going to camp when they go sit in their fucking lake house. Mm-hmm. And I've noticed this from people in Maine quite a bit, that they, that the rich people are insecure and they act like they're just regular, like they don't have... So I'm talking with this girl on Tinder from Maine, right? And we're talking, it's going well, we're connecting, and she's like, oh, I'm not sure if I... You seem very open-minded. I go, yeah, I, I know myself. She goes, man, I said, I don't know if I should tell you this thing about my past. And I go, well, now you have to. Yeah. Tell me what's up. She goes, I used to do porn. I go, really? She's like, I was a porn star. And I go, she was in her 20s. I go, you're kind of young. She goes, from 18 to 21, I did gangbang porn. And I go, what? She goes, That's I like w- a 30-year career doing regular porn. I was, <laughs> 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 she, she goes, I did gangbang porn. 
Wow. From 18 to 21. And I go, what? <laughs> you do? I go, what? You, for real? And she goes, yeah, I did gangbang porn. And uh, I used to, in the city, you know, in, in Boston, they would, you know, have these gangbang parties. Right? Like, like eyes wide shut type of shit. Hmm. Where, which is always my biggest aggravation when I would talk to rich people and they would act like there was, uh, like when I go to a fucking snuff Go do snuff stuff. It's different. It's classy, you yeah, know. Yeah. And no, she's you just like, have nice champagne. Yeah, and stuff yeah. Instead of Bud Light. Yeah, when, when yeah. you're sacrificing a child, okay, you mm. just you're doing it on a uh, <laughs> a, a marble countertop, okay. Right. right. And she goes, uh, yeah, they were tested though. You know, it was all good. And I was like, these are, you know, I'm like, that's kind of weird. And I was like, you know, grown ass men lining up to, but they were tested and they were vetted, so it was different. It was classy. <laughs> Anyway, I find out that she tells me that. She expresses the fact that she, she, and this is a very main thing based on what I'm about to say, because she then, I go, so where in Maine are you from? And she wouldn't tell me. And I go, why? And she goes, well, people, when they find out what town I'm from, you know, it's a, like, it's considered a, a rich town. And, and everyone, if she would tell people in Maine what town she's from, they would give her so much shit. She's brutally insecure about the- Scarborough. Fact. It might have been. Yeah, I don't know. I, I forget, but <laughs> she was brutally insecure. That is a, weird about her the class thing. Mm -hmm. So so insecure about saying where she was from because they had money that she they're so hell bent on pretending that I'm just part of the the proletariat. Uh, the, and I go, I don't know Maine, so I don't have a reference point. And then later on, I ask her. Her fa grandfather would buy a certain type of car for everyone in their family, right? Jesus. And she told me, and I go, how much is the car? And she goes, well, that's very presumptuous to ask to ask me the cost of the car. And I'm like, bitch, you just told me you did gangbang porn, but you're insecure <laughs> about telling me the cost of your car or where you come from? And it was so crazy to me that she was completely open with, hey, I used to get gang fucked. We're fine, whatever, that's your business, do your thing. But insecure about admitting to me her socioeconomic status. Mm. I go, that's... Based on women like I've fooled around with in Southern Maine, mm -hmm. that's that's very much a Southern Maine thing. Yeah, it it is because uh, I mean that's why local humor. I don't know if you've you know Bob Marley. I'm aware Bob of him. Marley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he uh, I mean he's big in New England, kind of, but he's really big in Maine. And all he does is like tag all his jokes with, "Oh yeah, this old lady from Westbrook," and because that's her identity. Yeah, is the town they're from. You know what I mean? It's it's it really is a lack of identity. I'm like the people in this town, but you're not. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But it, there is this weird. This town is like this. This town is like this. This town. That's why he. I mean, he's a bad example because he goes all over. But most comedians I see coming up, they kind of try that local humor, and then they'll go somewhere else, and it just doesn't work. Yeah. You know what I mean? And because that's all they know in a way. That's why I deliberately avoid it. I do I, I avoided specific boss and stuff coming up yeah and i have a certain joke that i use in my act where um i make fun of a guy based a theoretical guy based on and then i throw his location in there and whatever state i'm in i just pick whatever their shitty town is that they make fun of mm -hmm. in mass it's worcester in rhode island it's woonsocket in new hampshire it's manchester and nashua in excuse me in maine it's biddeford mm -hmm. right and if i go somewhere else i'll pick somewhere else but i watch people I did everything I could to avoid Boston centric shit coming up because I didn't want it to define me. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like, it, it is a culture, you know? Mm -hmm. But I feel like Maine just needs to embrace being from Maine. Because mm, yeah. I meet Mainers and they're so, like, they're like, they, they're very much defined about, about the fact that they're not Massachusetts and they hate mass holes, which I get. I hate mass holes too. Mm -hmm. And they don't want mass holes coming up to Maine. But then I feel like they act like Massachusetts people with their uh, ideologies. I'm like, mm -hmm. you guys are just as progressively elitist as anyone from Mass. Yeah. If you're going to be Maine, just be from Maine. Get your mm -hmm. fucking Governor Paula Page tattoo, okay? Yep. Fucking <laughs> wear your lumberjack shit. Just be fucking, just, just, what's that brandy you guys all like? The coffee brandy? Oh, yeah, yeah. Allen's. Allen's. Allen's yeah, get yeah. your Allen's. Do mm -hmm. your. Like, and because it's weird because there is like this weird thing I meet with Mainers where they're like very anti, like they're so 
they become very radical because they're they're trying to be anti what Maine is. And then on the other hand, you have like the hokey Maine thing, which you guys more than any other state in New England kind of have a thing going on where I keep hearing about Allen's Brandy and mm-hmm. uh, like Maine, like a lot of Maine comics. You can just uh, LL Bean. Yeah, yes. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's like there is a thing there that that it kind of wraps around. Mm-hmm. I think the issue is if what you're wrapping around is what you buy, that's when you lose your thing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because I think that's what like our issue is with Americans is is we're like, what makes you American? Well, McDonald's. And I go, they have McDonald's everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Now, Coca Cola. Well, they have Coca Cola everywhere. Mm-hmm. Your identity is going to be more than just the shit you consume. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I have. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm one of those guys. I, I embrace Maine for what it is, but I yeah. want to leave. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've just lived there my entire life. Well, what did you think of Texas? Uh, you went out to Austin. I, I liked it. Uh, I liked Austin. It, Austin reminded me of Portland too, which is the other thing. Like, oh, this comedy scene's popping up. Well, it's happened everywhere. I hate Portland. Uh, yeah, I, there's, there's I, very I think it was cooler than Portland. Places but. I quite detest more than Portland, and I want to give it. A, I want to like Portland, but mm-hmm. every time I go there, I'm just going. Why is it thirty dollars for a cheeseburger? I'm in <laughs> Maine. Stop trying to yeah. be Manhattan. Just yeah. What is this? Why it's are you? So weird. There was always just a. The places like Burlington and Portland, they want to be Brooklyn, New York so bad. Yeah. But you're not. If you want to be Brook, hipster Brooklyn, go to Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. But you can't you you're not you can't recreate that in a little town. Yeah. It just doesn't work. Although I mean there's a lot of money coming in from like people moving there because they think back. they think it's a great town. And so all these people who actually do make money come in and then they are able to raise the rent they're raising the property taxes there they can pay 30 bucks for a burger Mm -hmm. and then people are getting priced off of portland and they're moving out to the smaller towns around it but it's yeah it's it's a really weird economic well when you went to to texas did you find it did you find your did you like performing there better than maine um Yes and no. I mean, I got on a showcase, but it was outdoors. It was kind of... I, I like there was this uh, a mic I did in Fort Worth because we went to Austin for a while. Then we went to Fort Worth and then yeah. back to Austin and flew out. And um, yeah, I, I had fun. I kind of looked over my material to make sure it wasn't too... Maine? New, Maine or New England. You know what I mean? Because, I mean, you've, you've seen me. I'm kind of angry. I didn't know how that would go over in Texas. You had angry dudes in Texas. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, for sure. But uh, I didn't know how it would go because I hadn't met anyone who'd done comedy there or whatever. Um, except J.T. Habersat, and he's kind of like, he's no, angry, but he's like, doesn't present it like I do, I guess. Um, yeah, no, I, I liked it there. I think I had to spend more time, though, to really get a feel for it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just ate my balls at a lot of mics. <laughs> well, that's that, those open mics, dude. That's what yeah, they're mics, always like that. It doesn't matter where you're at in the world. A, a fucking mic is a, is a place where you you go up and take a hit. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. Yeah. And if you're killing at the mics, it's often a representation that what you're doing isn't going to kill in front of a real audience. Yeah, because a lot of it, if you're playing in the back of the room, mm-hmm. stuff like that. That's why I don't like roast battles. No, I'm not into them. I'm either. not. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, they can be really funny. They could be, have some great zingers and stuff, but it it just you're really just playing to the comics who know the comic you're roasting, you know what I mean? And it's also predicated upon what the person looks like. Almost all mm-hmm. the jokes are. I just I don't know. It doesn't hold a lot of water for me. So where would you if you if you were trying to get out of Maine? Where mm-hmm. are you thinking about going? I would. Uh, I think about Austin, but I'd have to stay there a little longer. I think to really get a feel for it. If not there, maybe Chicago. Chicago's not a bad maybe spot. Maybe New York, but New York is insanely huge. You know what I mean? It's yeah. I'd I'd be shell shocked immediately going um, to New York. Yeah. New York is I don't I mean, I don't want to discourage anyone from, from going there if it's right for them. Mm. Or else I do want to encourage people if it's the right time. Mm-hmm. But it's um how do I put this delicately? Uh, you're not what they're looking for. Um, <laughs> and I don't, yeah, and that's just, yeah. no one's going to look at you and go, I want, you You just, you're not checking off the right blocks. Mm-hmm. And 
Um, Chicago wouldn't be bad because in Chicago you can drive to all the other places in the Midwest and work the road. Yeah. And then Florida. I don't. You ever think of Florida? Yeah. No, you couldn't uh, do Florida. I couldn't. I couldn't. I think you wear too much black for Florida. I dude. think so. Yeah. I wear. I dress like this year round. You know, to just go to, black. Go to Montana. Montana. Yeah. Is that the Big Sky Comedy Festival? Yeah, Big Sky. Yeah, out there. Montana yeah. could be fun. Yeah, I really want to just work the road, but it's so hard to get. Like, I mean, unless you're making your own rooms as you go, yeah, it's hard to get to that step of I'm going to this city and this city and this city and this city. At least it is for me. I don't know. I don't, I don't even, know what I'm doing. I don't even look on it as that glamorous as mm. I used to. When yeah. I, when I was a younger comic, I looked on the road as glamorous. And then I got to meet some of the old road dogs, and I realized that they're not. You're rolling into a new city and worrying about whether or not you can sell out this room. Now, if you are yeah. if you are a bigger name, you're Bill Burr, then it doesn't matter. You're right. sold out. It's right. irrelevant. But if you're not at that level, and it can be fun when you're young and you're still getting fucked up, and you don't care that you just pissed your pants that night, whatever. I'm in a new place. <laughs> it doesn't matter. That kind of thing can yeah. be fun, but it does. It gets. I don't know. I, I guess uh, as you get older, you want more stability. But I, and I don't mind traveling. Mm-hmm. Like I want to travel. Yeah. That's why I focused on my YouTube and shit. But it's. I don't know. If, if for me, it's um. I I was like, oh, I'd have to spend all this time away from people that I care about. Yeah. Kind of on the road and get lonely. Yeah. So, but but at the same time, it is it's part of the game. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's true. I mean, I, I've just, I want to see the country. I want to, because I've yeah. been in Maine my whole life. I've gone to a couple places, but that's it. You what know, if I'd, what if you just saw the country and comedy was a backup to it? Like, don't mm. make, I'm going to see the country through comedy. See the country yeah. and set up shows as you go. Yeah, yeah. I think that was one of my biggest lessons was I was trying to get results in life through comedy. Yeah. Instead of doing results just on their own and mm-hmm. then having comedy come with it. Yeah. You know, because like if if you wait, and f- if we wait for someone to invite us or to give us the green light, mm-hmm. we're gonna fucking wait forever. You know, so you can just plan a trip, drive around, and mm-hmm. say, uh, and then just email some people and be like, "Hey, you run a show in this town? Yeah, I'm in town. Can I get on?" Nine out of ten times, I'll let you do it. Yeah, you know, it's uh, and then and then you get more material as you go. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I like about a lot of the road comics. And plus, they develop, they, they see the sense of humor all over the co- the country. And they can morph it a little. Like, Stanhope. I mean, you you know how yeah. that dude's so funny. And he it's because best. he was just a road dog for a long time. And now he's got his own following, so he makes plenty of money at mm-hmm. it. But, like, that's one of the reasons they say he got so funny is because he was doing comedy in Montana. And then he would go to L.A. And then he would be in Vegas. And then he would be you know it's nebraska you know what i mean and he just different people with different backgrounds and life experiences and he'd make them all laugh eventually you know dude i did i did a show this week it was like in a a weird hipster rock club and i walk in and it's mostly just um all the girl, they're all still wearing the masks, which is kind of like for a symbol sense, right? It's mm-hmm. kind of for people that's it's an identity thing. Here's my bandana. I'm part of this clique, mm-hmm. and um, it's a very weird environment. It's like a 50 year old guy dressed like a girl, but like everyone else there was really young. It was just kind of weird. Mm. And I went up at the end of the show and just, dude, I fucking, I took a hot one. I bombed. There were these two hot girls in the audience, and I tried doing crowd work. So I was like, I'm not doing my material. I go on a blast. It's fucking 1140. I'm ex- I've been up since five. I'm done. You're done. And they were, I asked them, where they were, is anyone here from another country? They're from Lebanon. Hmm. I go, oh. Now, Lebanon used to be a French colony. So for a lot of people in Lebanon still speak French. If you're rich, you definitely do. It's yeah. part of the um, culture class. So I go, oh, parlez-vous français? And they go, Oh, wait. And I start giving him a few lines. Now, I have a thick accent, I'm aware. And I, I'm not, I, I'm like mediocre French. Yeah. And the girl just, and I go, I shouldn't have done this because they're just hot. They're hot. They give me, they go, that's not fucking French. And then just fucking tore into me for, Jesus. Like, for not, I'm like, oh, I'm just, I was trying to joke about it. I was like, I was a little self-deprecating about myself. Mm-hmm. You know, I was like, this is a big deal for someone like me to be able to even speak two words in French. Yeah. And they just, like, 
railed into me for just like being dumb and not being able to. And uh, I go, oh, that's weird. I just didn't even know how to connect with this audience. Yeah. And I go, why don't like, I feel like the stratification between um, like the, the yuppies of the city and that new caste system, the professional managerial class of people who work from home and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, those type of people who are, you know, earn meetings all day, making same amounts of money, and they're kind of everything that goes along with that personality. And then the people outside of that in the hinterlands, mm -hmm. it's just become a greater chasm. Yeah. And it's one sure. I want to bridge with my comedy. But, yeah. And I think in the right circumstances I can, but I realized, oh, fuck. Like sometimes you can just get up in front of an audience and go, I'm going to fucking eat a dick before yeah. I know. I, I'm just, it's going to happen. Like yeah. you, because they looked at me. And I know what I look like. I look like I was just in a militia, all right? And they didn't want anything to deal with me. So I was like, because it was an extra anger they kind of threw on me. Mm -hmm. I go, what is this? Is this just the hot, because hot girls get a, an anger, get, a, get a privilege with being mean. Because if, if, here's the thing. If those were chunky bitches, they probably wouldn't have been that rude. Mm-hmm. Because they also know I can go, you fat. So it's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> where was this room anyway? This so was in Somerville. Ah, uh, oh, Somerville. Yeah. Uh. You ever done a show in Somerville? Uh, I don't believe I have. It's uh, Cambridge's uh, chunkiest sister. Um, it's it's just like Portland. Ugh. Just think Portland, dude. Gross. Uh, same same kind of people and everything. Mm -hmm. And oh man, I was just. And I said, "What are you mad about?" This was, mm -hmm. it wasn't a paid gig. It wasn't, because I went home all salty. But I went home salty because I go, oh, I can't just, I don't have anything to prove anymore. Mm -hmm. So I don't need to do these gigs. This is not, um, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a, a, a pork butcher, all right, and I get mad at myself that I couldn't sell my pork outside of a fucking temple, well, it's kind of it's kind of how it works, man. They're not looking for my product. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that would be a really weird. I mean, I've I've struggled to connect with audiences too, but usually they're just drunk. Yeah. Yeah. You know? But uh, yeah, that's rough. I'm trying to figure because I'm I'm 35. Mm -hmm. I'm not that old, but I f feel older because I think the 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 rapid changing of culture between generations yeah. is so sped up so, yeah, that has, yeah. that a eight-year difference. And I also have to remember that a difference with younger people now is these guys have only grown up in the era of smartphones and social media. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm tapped into an old world that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. And it literally feels like I'm a century behind you. Yeah. In your culture. Yeah, that's true. I mean... Cause you got like my, my niece and nephews, they, they're always using a iPad and stuff like that. I'm like, I, I mean, my brother and I would play video games when I was a kid, but it was just very like, you couldn't do it anywhere. Yeah. You know, there was a certain time, but we would still go outside and stuff like that. But a lot of kids don't do that. And it's like, yeah, they might be really good and proficient with computers, but there's a lot of fundamental things that they're missing out on. I well, think that. Dude, I had this talk with my cousin and she was worried about getting her son a a Nintendo Switch. And I go, I promise you, because she goes, I don't know, what if he plays too many video games, that the video game system is better for him than the tablet you've given him. Yeah. I promise you, because the tablet is designed to be more addictive. Mm -hmm. A Nintendo Switch isn't ne necessarily, isn't addictive. You can mm -hmm. be addicted to playing video games, but I firmly believe it's better to be gaming with some other dudes on PlayStation than sitting on the tablet. Yeah. Then the tablet yeah. just leads to, to social media. Yeah, exactly. You're just like, ah, let me back out of this, check my Facebook, and I'll go back in. You know, it's constant like that. Because he was on YouTube, and she goes, I deleted YouTube. And I go, he can use YouTube through the internet app. Mm -hmm. And I, I did, normally I would never snitch on him, but I go, you know, because I, I genuinely believe this is bad for his development, but he's watching these goofy, it's just the worst content ever. Mm -hmm. It's just these five YouTuber. There, there's a type of YouTuber. That are not, they're not real people. You go, hey guys, it's, it's John 365, hit like and subscribe. Uh, uh, and yeah. today we're going to, and the way the camera angles, everything about it, it's, it's dystopian to me. It doesn't mm -hmm. feel like real human beings. And it kills. The way they film, 
we're going to go in. Is Katie in this room? Oh, no. There's a scary man in the room. Like, and, and he's watching these five kids eat pizza against one guy. There's a pizza eating contest against a professional eater. But none of them, the five pretty boys, all of a, their personalities aren't human to me. Mm-hmm. They doesn't. I, I feel like I'm looking at a person that isn't a person, like an android yeah. or an it, alien. It's very, uh, it's very uh, nihilistic. Yes, it, was, it has no point. You know what I mean? You're like, if you really thought about it, you'd be like, why am I watching this? It's kind of thing. It's content without purpose. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's. Uh, I. You know what? I and I guess that's most of our art today mm-hmm. is that there's no depth to it. Yeah. Consume this painting, music, whatever, but there's no. Especially music, mm. like what? What? So, how do, you're a metalhead? How mm. do you fucking when you turn on the radio and you got to hear the average bullshit? How long you must like tap out of it sooner than me? Yeah, yeah. What like, bands do you listen to? Uh, Opeth is my favorite. Yeah. Uh, very progressive. Like I like the musicality of metal. Uh, it's not always the heaviness, but a lot of these guys are well versed in a lot of different genres. And Opeth is one of those bands where they, they kind of bring it all together, but not in a nihilistic way. Some yeah. bands are like that, but they but they write great songs. Um, but yeah, when something comes on the radio, like Nickelback or something, and they just have... That's when you can hear the lyrics and you wish you hadn't. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because they're just... Yeah. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. It's, it's someone talking. It's like, it's like when you have a fake conversation with someone at work. Yeah. And you go, oh, we just said nothing for 45 minutes. Yeah. We talked about the weather. Hey, working hard or hardly working. Is there such a thing yeah. as pop metal? Like, is there is there metal that people would listen to and you go, oh, that's just industry metal, studio metal? Um, or is it metal so niche that you guys don't have to worry about that? There's... this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's like... Uh, yeah, there's there's some stuff that gets on the radio and it's just kind of like eh, but yeah. then there's a lot of like like the metalcore because it's been so prevalent for so many years and now it's getting popular. So and then it becomes all the same, you know what I mean? Um, so like oh, so punk rock came about and then there was pop punk, you know, and like mm-hmm. Blank and some and um, some people say Green Day's pop punk, some don't, but yeah, all that kind of came around and. I understand why people called it that. I listened to it when I was growing up. Mm-hmm. But there is there like a they're metal purists. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're kind of obnoxious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not a metal purist, but when I when I hear you know some metal and then I hear like a dubstep thing mixed in and then the whiny ass vocals, I'm like, I'm done. Yeah. I'm done. <laughs> the I was gonna say because it must be. I don't know. Like, it, it, it could, so do you find that there's met like in in has it influenced that part of music too, where there's just stuff that, because I feel like it's kind of hitting everywhere. Because so, certain rap I listen to has no depth to it. Yeah. And rap used to be fucking deep. Yeah, and and now it's like, oh, I drive a Maserati and there's fucking auto tune all over it. Yeah. It's, ugh, I hate auto tune. Hate well, it so much. It's kind of. Uh, do they do they have like screamcore auto tune? That would be fantastic um, if they did. I think some of the stuff they, yeah, uh, you'll, they'll throw auto tune in a little bit in uh, in the chorus because it's like the poppy part, mm-hmm. and then they'll go back into this heavy thing. And I don't know. I mean, there a lot of a lot of like metalcore became a lot of it was uh, about personal strength. A lot yeah. of like if you listen to old hate breed and stuff. That was that was what it was all about. Was I'm going to stand up for myself? And now they've adopted that, but it doesn't sound genuine. It's like the lyrics are still about that, but it's just not. You know what I mean? It's like for the sake of I'm going to stand up for myself. Yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> well, you, <laughs> well, it's hard to stand up for yourself when you're uh, when. Well, standing up for yourself means becoming yourself and pissing off people because yeah. not everyone's going to like you. Yeah. And we've been kind of taught not to do that. Yeah. Because yeah, you, exactly. you saying, I want this. Well, that comes at the expense of me. Well, tough right. shit. Right. You know, in, 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 in society standards or relationship standards and all standards. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, it's, it's definitely the, the, there was that in hardcore too, mm-hmm. where it was, there needs to be more motivation, motivational, like metal and hardcore. Oh, yeah. 
It yeah. needs to be like a metal version of um, Les Brown or Tony Robbins. Yeah, should be. I mean, metal, you can't hear the lyrics most of the time anyway, but, I do, which is half the fun. Yeah? <laughs> yeah? You think that's it? Is Because I, I, every now, now and then when I tune in, I go, I don't know what's fucking being said. <laughs> I just know that there's a lot of... Burr, burr, burr. Yeah, yeah. And it, it excites me. Yeah. Sometimes it's meaningless, like Cannibal Corpse. It's just about serial killer shit. Yeah. It's like horror movie metal, I guess. There's then, a, you know. there's a, I think they're a Danish metal band and they sing songs about like war and stuff and knights and, um, peg and stuff. Um, I see them all the time on Facebook. I get ads to go to their concerts. Yeah. Like if main thing is bald. Sabaton? Sabaton. Yes, that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a few of those. It's like. There's a band called 1914. It's all about World War One. Yeah, I've heard about yep. them too. Yeah, see that stuff. I want. I want like a nice metal epic. Yeah, that that um goes over a, a journey, mm-hmm. as opposed to you know like I feel like there was a phase of that in the 70s with like people singing about Lord of the Rings. Yeah, but it was it was like there it was the period of rock right there where like Zeppelin. Yeah, yeah, where you know people were willing to but then they had the guys that recreated it who weren't cool mm-hmm. like the guy who was like you know band this like I'm gonna sing a, make a song about the Hobbit and then you go dude I'm not <laughs> yeah I'm not listening to your fucking Hobbit bullshit um yeah I like I like music like that it does tell a story and I lo- that's why I like Opeth they're uh they're great at lyrics and they don't always scream they don't actually they haven't for four albums but they they're kind of rooted in that 70s yeah like zeppelin camel renaissance kind of the music's really epic you but, know but people still obsessed with greta van fleet you know, know what i'm talking about yeah i know them yeah the one that everyone's like it's the new led zeppelin yeah I don't know. I, I think I think that was short lived. They're still making music, but I remember just everyone being like, "Dude, fucking, it's just like it's like Zeppelin all over again." And then I listened to it, and I just didn't. Yeah, it's not exactly Led it, Zeppelin, you know. But it also just didn't. They're also kids with rich kids. parents, probably. You know and what I mean? It, like, I just yeah. feel like that time's passed. Yeah, like, it's just it doesn't fit. We're trying to recreate something. Yeah, I'm yeah. glad they're not trying to recreate Hanson. Yes. <laughs> you know, I'd rather have them recreate Zeppelin, Deep Purple. You know what's funny is growing up you used to you, like I would we, me and my cousins and friends would make fun of you fuck you want to fuck the dudes from Hanson. You're like yeah, that was everyone everyone said and you always try and trick one of your friends and be like, "Hey, do you think these girls are hot?" And he goes, "Yeah." And you fucking homo, it's a dude. <laughs> and, like Hanson was like the the greatest punchline ever as a kid. Yeah. But nowadays, they would just be trans like i just feel like yeah, someone yeah. would just <laughs> probably they probably they wouldn't even be trans i think their manager would be like okay you have to go on stage in a dress do you, you have, i feel like there's got to be a manager out there who's really trying to transition one of his artists just like you know you should oh. really just consider hormone therapy and like i know i just no nah, i'm good and just like you know you your record sales would really go up if you just shave the adam's apple just get rid of <laughs> that just I'm I think that's yeah. I think that's going to happen. We're right around the corner from that because we already have corporations like, uh, like Pepsi. Remember when they were having all those riots and then they had Kim Kardashian yeah. with the Pepsi give it to a police officer or some shit? Like, where? What are we, dude? I found this <laughs> this autistic kid on TikTok. <laughs> he's, 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 he's he's an autistic rapper from Ireland. Oh Jesus. And he looks it. Now there's some people like he's faking it, but I don't know. He seemed pretty legit to me. And he's got so many followers. And one thing he found out was that he found out, you know, that, you know, an autistic people want attention. Sometimes Mm -hmm. we all want attention, but they kind of do it in a more autistic way as well. And he, he, now I've read reports that some kids in school who are autistic are just saying they're trans now anyway because they get attention if they do it. And he realized that if he picked woke topics, he would get flooded by people like, you're an ally, I'm an ally, yeah. And so he made this, he started, people had paid for him to come to the U.S. and tour because he just has this t- song where he goes, um, trans people are my friends, transphobes, you can get these hands. And he just sings that that, that <laughs> lyric over and over again. Trans people are my friends, 
transphobes, you can get these hunts. And he, people have been bringing them city to city. And obviously <laughs> his audience is, is very is woke and trans people showing up. And like his new TikTok videos are just him like in a restaurant eating potatoes, like making sure that these potatoes aren't ableist or transphobic. You know, everything, <laughs> every video he has is him combating ableism or transphobia but it's like this dog was barking at me must be ableist and transphobic but he's because he's autistic <laughs> you can clearly see that he like doesn't get it but he just knows if i put these he's figured out put words in here get likes yeah <laughs> and it works <laughs> and i feel like we're we're not that far away from that kind of uh uh music i mean we're already there with oh like, yeah i think yeah entertainment so it's, I think uh, that's the next step. Yeah, is that you know Electra is going to call up whoever their big artist is at the time and just be like, oh, you know, you start wearing a dress and then, you know, you you, you start taking hormone therapy. I don't really want. To. Well, you want two million dollars, don't you? Yeah. It's going to be weird how punk rock does a total shift from back in the day. Rock and roll was like sticking it to the man and conservative principles, and new punk rock. You know, it used to be punk rock was burning like effigies of Christ and, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, defiling a church, being ridiculous, you know, yeah. uh, satanic symbols. Now punk rock is going to be misgendering someone. That's what it's going to be. <laughs> like the new generation of punk oh, it's rock there. It's there. Is, is someone coming on stage going, Caitlyn Jenner is a man. <laughs> <laughs> there is uh, oh, what there was the punk thing for a while, too, was was it. Oh, what is the name of that band? Against Me? No, it's not Against Me. No, that's the one where the guy became... He is a woman now. They're, yeah, they're yeah, yeah. That was yeah. That was the one I was thinking of. She's fucking great, you know? But like, she was she was like, I'm trans. Like, as a punk thing. I'm, obviously, is trans. Yeah. But I mean, like, that was like, fuck you, I'm me. You know what I mean? And uh, But she's she seems really fucking cool about it. You know what I mean? It's not like this new... I have blue hair and big glasses and... You know what I mean? Like, uh, uh, punk is, is about standing up for yourself and other people, but it is also, it's getting kind of, how do I put it? I have some punk friends, so I don't want to offend them. Fuck them. Yeah. yeah. It's, so it's about being you. Right. And if you're going to be you, sometimes you're going to say shit people don't like. But there, there's a lot of punks that's like, no. vote Democrat. It's like, you're not... That's not punk. That's not what it is. <laughs> Tell, was, telling me, e, uh, telling me to join either party is not punk. Yeah. Telling me to stand up for the system is not punk. Yeah. Um, telling me to to stand behind corporations is not. If you're telling me, fucking, we need to support Disney. There's nothing punk about that. You kind of lost right. the. <laughs> and I don't think you should be punk. Punk shouldn't be political in either way. It can be whichever way you want. Usually, it to be. like anarchist yeah kind of like i've just don't touch me kind of thing you know i'm just gonna be me we're all we could all just be ourselves leave me alone that was punk for years mm -hmm. you know uh, black flag and all shit like well yeah it was a punk was a thing where you could show up and if you were a dude wearing a wig you could mm -hmm. rock your wig and if you were um i don't know toxically fucking masculine you could be toxically fucking masculine mm -hmm. you could be gg allen yeah, yeah. Was, <laughs> I don't know what you'd call him, but I know I I would call him like the the uh, true anarchist. Like that's a true. Proper yeah, anarchist. He, yeah, that was. He, it doesn't get much more uh, anarchist than Gigi Allen. Gigi <laughs> Allen was punk rock's interpretation of Zen philosophy, which was that nothing matters and you're all gonna fucking die and just mm -hmm. just own it. He was like, um, he was. He was Vermont's version of the Greek philosopher Di Di Diogenesis. <laughs> he was oh yeah, <laughs> Di excuse me, Diogenes. He was Diogenes. Diogenes. Uh, just because Diogenes lived in a barrel with dogs, right, and just and would just you know piss and defecate where he felt like, and yeah. just he lay out naked in the sun, and everyone in Athens was like, "This guy's fucking ridiculous," you know. <laughs> just why don't you just uh, just get a wife and have fun? And, and Diogenes is like. Ah, eh, we're all gonna die. Fuck you and your system, and I'll just live off the money people gave me. Yeah, that's what I might. I think I'm giving Gigi Allen too much credit, but I think he just uh, wanted to. He said he wanted to make punk dangerous again. That was one of his yeah his things. Make make rock and roll dangerous. 
And, uh, you know, you needed your shots if you were going to a G.G. Allen show, for sure. There well, was some he, danger he, he there. spit on everyone. Yeah, he spit. He would shit. And they throw his shit at he you. He'd rub it all over himself. And he was uh, interesting. How did he die again? <laughs> Suicide or overdose? Uh, it was overdose. Yeah. But he wanted to kill himself on stage because he felt like you should kill yourself at the peak energy, you know, when you're feeling your best instead of at your lowest point. Mm-hmm. And he didn't get to do that. He, he just did a bunch of heroin one night and a bunch of people were taking pictures of his dead that. body yeah, and right. they didn't know he now. was dead. I think I think Stan Hope is the closest comedy has to a Gigi Allen. And yeah. not not because he's not going to, he's not ex, you know throwing his shit at people, but he's a guy who's kind of, and I heard him say this on stage, s- expects to die and has sacrificed his mind and body for his art form, right? Yeah, yeah. And so he still drinks and smokes. And yeah. I mean just... I was in a hotel room with him while he was you know, hitting, drinking some liquor, and he still he still potties, man. He's still in it. He still does a road life, but he also and he's a good dude. He's a great, awesome guy. But he, um, you know, he's putting himself through the ringer. But he also he believes that the performance is everything. Mm-hmm. So that's why he would take. He's taking Molly on stage. He told me about a time where he took acid and hit him right on stage. Yeah, I think there there was a, there's a bootleg of that. Yeah. that I found. Just called the acid bootleg, and, yeah. and it was like halfway through the show, he's like, "Yep, I can feel it kicking in now." Just carries on with his act. I'm like, how could you fucking do that, I could dude? Never imagine. No, oh, but he's so confident in himself. Yeah, you know what I mean. He just you... doesn't change once he gets when once he's high. He's the same person, you know. That's what uh, helped me. We'll wrap up in a second. Yeah. What really helped me with stand up was once I got to a point where. What I was doing on stage was what I was doing off stage. Then it didn't. Then everything became so much easier. Really? Yeah, yeah. I can see that. When I, because it used to be I'd I'd have to turn on like a switch to go on stage. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of us go through that, and some people really. We've all met those comics who they really yep. flip a switch. Mm-hmm. And people would say that about me because I'm most of the time I'm just kind of quiet. Yeah. You know what I mean? But then when I get on stage, I'm this angry dude. And Bill Hicks was like that too, where he was just a different, but it was, it, it's still me. You know it's what just I mean? A, you're showing a different one. Of I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I don't want to be angry all the time. I'm yeah. like that a little bit, but not, not that bad. And then when I get on stage, it's just, I enhance that. You know what? Tony V put it to me like this. It's an enhanced version of you. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you are on stage is an enhanced version. Yeah. Yeah. Tony V is great. He's, he helped me tremendously when I first started out. You're doing cl- some stuff with Joe Yannetti, right? Yeah, he's he's got a class in, uh, oh, what's the name of the town? Joe's oh, it's, great, it's, uh, it's Lowell at the Olympia Restaurant, hmm. and uh, he has he has that going on. He does it weekly, but you don't go for like six weeks. You just go, you you pay a little bit of money to Joe, and then you might show up three weeks later. And yeah, But uh, yeah, Joe's awesome, dude. He's giving me great feedback. Like, nobody really likes to give feedback, it seems like. Because a lot of people can't fucking take it. Yeah. I couldn't take feedback when I first started. Yeah. I thought I was so sensitive Mm -hmm. about my act when I, for for years. Yeah. Incredibly sensitive, because I felt like, this is my thing, and this is me, and if they criticize this, they're criticizing me. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of times, not even criticizing, they're just trying to help you. Yeah, yeah, most of the time. Yeah. That's why I, I take it like that. I'm just like, yeah, just helping me out. And uh, he he told me some things. He's like, "Hey, yeah, you, you could tell me to fuck off." I'm like, "Dude, I'll t- you're Joe Yannetti. I'll take advice from you." Yeah. I but mean, he he was he gave me almost like a is like a Zen thing, like learn to say things without saying them directly. Yeah. Was but it was almost like he tried to explain it. I'm like, "No, I, I get you. Almost can't explain it. You just have to you have to think this thing through, and without saying your actual opinion or or." telling me what it was you tell me what it was through like the long way it's you know what i mean in a way it's it's a veil Mm -hmm. in a sense and it feels weird because especially with social media and tiktok everything is say your point in fucking three seconds yeah and so i noticed my act started becoming very more to the point Mm -hmm. where i go oh i'm I'm missing something i used to have which was that i could walk people down a line and they could get an idea of where i was coming from yeah. But I didn't have to fucking lay it on super thick. Because then, then you just lose part of the audience already. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes if you... Like, directness can be funny, mm-hmm. but also there's more than one way to say something. 
You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And I like to, with my jokes, I like to take people somewhere. You know what I mean? Because I, I, I might start with a one-liner and then I'll form a bit out of it. But for the most part, I, I one-liners, you know, they're funny. They can be really funny, but it's just not me. Yeah, you know it's what not I mean? me either. Yeah. Well, dude, thanks for coming on, man. No problem, dude. Thanks for having me. What, uh, where can people find you? Uh, I'm on Facebook, uh, Mike Gray Comedian. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. I don't do Twitter. Not Twitter's a Twitter dying. Twitter's, Twitter's dying, dying anyway. Well, unless Elon pulls a, a Hail Mary, but yeah. I don't see that happening. Um, Instagram, too, Mike.Gray86 is my handle there. You got a YouTube, anything else? Uh, nothing on YouTube right now. Get on that. Dude. I know. I, I want to, uh, I want to do some sketch work and stuff like that, but. Put your stand up on YouTube. Oh, I, I guess I can. It's all it's all unlisted right now, but I can change that. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. You, People always talk about burning material. I don't think I have to. Ah, uh, that that's that's an older concept. The reality of the situation is, um, even if you put out some jokes, what does it matter? Like, what are the chances? You're. I used to be afraid of that. I learned that from some of the older guys. Don't burn your material. Don't. Well, that's assuming I make a special. Yeah. Right? That's assuming that I get a fucking Netflix deal and then everyone's already seen my jokes. Mm-hmm. Right? If I get one, it's Netflix deal, I'll write new fucking jokes. Yeah. All right? The don't worry about burning material. How often is someone, because millions of the people that, if let's say your shit goes viral. Yeah. They're not, they won't even be in your fucking town. Yeah. So what is, what is the chance that the audience is going to have all these people who've seen your material already? Yeah. It's just ludicrous. That's what GM Papa told me when he yeah. put his album out in 2020. He's like, no one's, he's like, people will listen to this, sure, but a vast majority of people won't. Yeah. So they still haven't heard my stuff. They haven't heard your jokes. Yeah. Don't ever worry about burning shit like that. Um, well, anyway, dude, thanks for coming yeah. on. And, no problem, uh, dude. Hopefully uh, some people check your stuff out. And yeah, I hope so. You got any shows coming up? Uh, I got uh, McHugh's Comedy Club June Fifth and uh, fourth and fifth, I believe. And one of those nights, there's a big show at the Wilbur, which I would also recommend. Which but one's that? Sh- that's uh, Brian Glowacki. Brian's show, that's right. Alex is going to be open for me. Yeah, yeah. Paper. He's a good dude. And uh, yeah, most of the stuff is up in Maine. But uh, yeah, McHugh's in, in Portsmouth. Third and fourth, that's what it is. June 3rd and 4th. Well, all right, man. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. No problem, dude. Thanks for having me.